So we start today on page 21. And uh, while you're opening, we'll take a quick look at the calendar. Uh, today, October the 23rd, we talk about clinical studies. Uh, this is going to kind of relate to the statistical studies that we talked about the last two classes ago. Um, capture recapture method we did last time with the sampling. So we've been doing lots of sampling, and today we'll relate all that to uh, talking about clinical stuff. Uh, and then after today, we kind of segue or change gears, I guess, into talking about counting and probability. And so. Um, so that's the plan, and one more cell that I've highlighted over there is Project 1 is due on October the 30th. That is one week from today, okay? The project is due one week from today. Um, I do accept them late, but there are lateness penalties. The details are in the syllabus, uh, but better than taking those penalties is to do the thing in the next week and turn it in on time, all right? And again, if you're doing the conduct your own election project, I'm happy to give you a, a minute in class to distribute your ballots and have people in here vote if you're interested, but you got to let me know that you're going to do that. Any questions on the calendar? Okay. So uh, again, we're starting here on page 21. Uh, just one more note. Uh, well, I guess we'll have the calendar up here. Uh, what thing is happening two weeks from today that's important? This is the election day. So last night was the last presidential debate. Hopefully you had a chance to check it out. If not, go on YouTube or read about it or do something. Just get informed. Um, make your decision. Uh, I just want to highlight, though, that there are many other elections happening on election day. It is not just a vote for president. There are many uh, local positions that are open. There are also several... Um, I don't know what the technical term is, it, but there are three things that we're supposed to vote on uh, yes or no, there's something about uh, like legalizing medical marijuana. That, that, like there's, there are other issues out there. So, so it's not just about picking a presidential candidate, but also staying and getting informed on some of these other topics. So uh, as you go into the ballots on that Tuesday, November the 8th, you're going to be faced with three yes-no questions. It is easy to figure out what they are. Just go out and look. Um, and uh, again, just uh, head in there prepared to make your vote count. Okay, so we are here on page 21. Uh, we will start with number one. Can we begin with Laura? Okay, so... Um, so you hear the results of clinical studies all the time. Many advertisements out there trying to sell you something claim to have clinical data backing up what they want you to believe. Um, just like the other day, we start with vocabulary. And again, the, the main summary of the entire class today is before you buy into whatever they are selling, make sure you understand the stuff behind the scenes. Ask the questions before you believe that, uh, that buying this particular product will cure this particular ailment. Okay, so we'll go to two. Um, are you ready for two? Go ahead. Keep going. It's dangerous to conclude that there is a causation when there may only be Okay, Mary. Okay, so this is an absolute fact. As the number of cavities goes up in school-aged children, so does their vocabulary. It's true, completely true. Is there a cause and effect relationship, or are they both a result of some other third variable lurking underneath the water? Age. Why are they getting more cavities? Because they're getting older. Why is their vocabulary better? Because they're getting older. So it's not that one causes the other. They are associated with each other, but really it's some other thing lurking underneath. It's their age, okay? And so it's really dangerous to look at true statements like this as the number of cavities goes up, so does vocabulary. And I don't know what how our, our brains are wired in this way, but we sort of automatically jump to this conclusion that, oh, it must be that the cavities cause the increased vocabulary. Okay, obviously this one is silly and nobody in this room jumped to that conclusion, but there are a lot of other kind of this thing goes up as this thing goes up that people are going to want you to buy. Oh, it's a cause and effect when it might not be that at all. Okay, uh, let's go to Nicole for B.
Okay, so this is a description of a controlled study. So if we wanted to decide if uh, drug X will make you happy, uh, we want to make it a controlled study. So that means we take some folks and we give them drug X. But if we just give everybody drug X, then we don't have a control. We don't have a comparison. And so we have these two groups. You've got the group that's going to get drug X, and then you have the group that's not going to get drug X. Maybe they get this thing, which we'll talk about, called the placebo. Maybe they don't get anything. But anyway, uh, if you split up into these two groups and you give some of them the drug and some of them not, that is called a controlled experiment. Okay, we'll go around to Grace, the results. Okay, so we're building this vocabulary. Uh, you don't want some scientists to decide who's going to get the drug and who's not because they may either consciously or subconsciously find the happiest people in the group and give them the drug. The drug didn't make them happy. They already happened to be happy. And so instead of uh, having a human being make a choice, we'll let the computer randomly decide who's going to get the drug and who's not. And that's what makes it a randomized controlled study. We'll go to Chelsea for C. I'm sorry, not Chelsea. Mariah, sorry. All right, and confounding variables are these kind of hidden. We might not think about them, but we need to uh, on the test. I'm going to give you a little paragraph that describes the results of some clinical study, and I'm going to ask you to just name a couple of confounding variables. And so if the clinical study claims that this weight loss drug uh, is effective, uh, then perhaps one of the confounding variables would be exercise. And it could happen that the people that get this weight loss drug happen to be exercising regularly. And so it's not the drug that we're seeing the effect of, it's the exercise. And so confounding variables are these things that we'll want to think about um, kind of lurking behind the scenes. Okay, we're going to Tim for uh, D. Okay, so again, this, uh, this is outside of my realm of expertise, but uh, having a lot to do with the brain, it is absolutely true that if I gave you guys some pill right now and I said this is going to make you happy, so generally we're going to get a little bit happier even if the pill is, is nothing. The pill could just be you know, like a sugar pill. It, has, it should have no effect. But just by me making the suggestion that this is going to make you happier, our brains are really powerful things, and they control a lot of stuff in our body. And so, um, so it turns out that uh, that uh, if we give uh, some people the actual happy drug and some other people the placebo, it turns out both groups are actually going to get a little bit happier. Um, and so we need to account for that fact. All right, let's go to Lucas for to account. I'm just going to throw some numbers up here, just making something up. Uh, suppose that um, that we have our control group and then the treatment group, which is the one that gets the drug. The treatment group. All right, so the treatment group gets the drug. Control group is going to get our placebo. And let's suppose that uh, the control group, it doesn't get, they just get this sugar pill. It shouldn't make them any happier, but it makes them 10% happier. I don't even know what that means, but just putting numbers on it. And let's suppose that the treatment group who actually gets the drug, so the control group shouldn't have gotten any happier. They didn't get anything that should have made them happier, but just in their minds, they, they thought they were getting something that would make them happier, and so uh, it did. So what if the treatment group who actually gets the happy drug gets 30% happier? So what percentage would you say is the effect of the drug is the 20%? Yeah, what we do is we subtract off those two things. We get rid of the placebo effect. Go ahead. How come?
Yeah, it's it's because of this idea that the brain can actually make you feel like if I give you something that, that I tell you is going to make you happier, the brain actually will start to make you happier before the drug even does anything. And it happens that the drug could do nothing and you'll still be a little bit happier. Not everybody, but we do a lot of people. We make this, uh, uh, this sample pretty big. We look at the control group who shouldn't get any happier, but they do by 10% just by the power of suggestion. The, the happiness drug makes you 30% happier, but we can't attribute all of that extra happiness to the drug because me just telling you, hey, this is going to make you happier will make you 10% happier. So we, we subtract that off, that placebo part off, and then we'll say, okay, so then the difference there, the 20%, that must be because of the drug as opposed to the power of the mind, uh, you know, and this idea of suggestion. It's weird. Patty. Mm -hmm. I need more details. Somebody, Mike? Yeah. And it still works. Yeah. Yeah, there, there have been lots of evidence of this kind of thing, and so we, we have to do this subtraction. Okay, so that's what we call a placebo-controlled study. Uh, and then where are we now? Is it Haley to increase? Okay, so two new words. Um, uh, so blind means that you're not supposed to know whether you're getting the real drug or the placebo, the fake. Okay, so the reasons for that should be clear, right? I mean, we don't want you to know whether you're getting the real drug or the fake. We want everybody taking the treatment uh, to, to feel the same heading into it so that we can then make this kind of comparison. Um, and then double blind. Well, why wouldn't we want the scientists to know who got the happy drug and who got the fake Okay, can somebody expand a little bit? Patty is talking about there might be bias if the scientists happen to know who's got what. Haley. I feel like if you knew the people who were actually taking the drug, you would want to know the scientists. Right, and so anytime there's um, uh, like observation happening, these scientists are supposed to report how much happier these people are than they were before. If they know who's got the real drug and who didn't, they might, as, as Haley says, they might be looking for happy behaviors when they, they could just be making stuff up, again, either consciously or subconsciously. And just to point out, uh, who generally pays the salaries of these scientists who are running the trials? Well, it's the drug companies. So they're, you know, like they're, there's a, an essential conflict of interest here. If the drug company wants you to say that this drug makes you 20% happier, you might be inclined to want to report, to, to look for things that aren't really there. Uh, so we really want to make sure that nobody knows anything about this. The, the, certainly the people taking the drugs should not know whether it's real or fake. And even the scientists who are monitoring and then looking at the results should also know who, who, who should also not know who was in which group. At the end of drug commercials, there's always a, like now more than ever, I feel like there is a huge verbalized list side effects that could happen, um, and they're usually, like, suicidal-related and or, like, death-related heart problems. Now, is that, like, a representation of the study not being carried out? Or what Anybody have any anything to comment on that? No, it's just a other study. Okay, could be legal reasons for, for really wanting to be safe. Any other thoughts on this? That's a good question. Thank you. All right. Let's go to uh, E. I think we're now in the back. We'll go to Greg. Okay. So we've got a whole new kind of study here. If I just say, hey, can I get some volunteers to take my happy drug? 
and we'll give some of you the real drug and some of you the fake, I could probably find some volunteers or maybe pay people. You'd be surprised how much uh, uh, um, like college students, grad students are willing to like put their bodies through the ringers for you know uh, the the money that are in these advertisements. I've actually particip I've participated in one. It wasn't a drug thing. It was like a like a visual, it was like a computer keyboard, and I was supposed to hit the button when light flashed on the screen. And so anyway, you can you can find people who are willing to to do the you know to maybe take the happy drug and maybe play this game on the computer, but you'd be hard pressed to find people helping to help you test this question: Does smoking cause lung cancer? You're probably not going to find people who are willing to take up smoking. So we got to do something different, right? So this is a really completely different kind of study than the hey, can we find some people who are willing to test this drug out? All right, let's go to Gary. Okay, so what we're going to do here to try to decide if smoking causes lung cancer is we're going to look at people who either already smoke, those are the Let's step here. Are those the causes or the, sorry, are those the cases or the controls? People that already smoke? Are the, the people who already smoke, are they the cases or the controls? Those are the cases. The people who already smoke are the cases, and the control group are the ones that, that don't, right? They don't get the happy pill. They don't smoke in this case. So we still have our two groups. But it's really like an after the fact, as opposed to I'm going to pick people and randomly decide this group is going to start smoking and this group is not. Here, it's just let's pick people and then you have to tell me which group are you in. Do you smoke or you don't? And that's going to dictate where you go. Um, and so it's really a different kind of study. And unfortunately, the vocabulary is kind of confusing because the first kind of study we've been talking about is called a controlled study. And this is called a case controlled study. All right. And so. For a case-controlled study, there are the cases and there are the controls. Those are the two groups, the people that, that smoke and the people that don't. For a controlled study, we'll just go back up and refresh our memory. Maybe it's on the previous page. For a controlled study, the two groups are the treatment group and the control group. Okay. So it's vocabulary, two really different kinds of studies. Unfortunately, a lot of the words sound the same or are the same. Uh, so uh, as you're as you're reading through the studies today, just make sure you try to keep that in mind. Okay, uh, and then this last sentence here: case-controlled studies are highly prone to confounding variables. Uh, if we look at people after the fact and we say, okay, if you smoke, you're in this group, and if you don't, you're in this group. Well, it could be that the people that tend to smoke might have other habits that are either healthy or unhealthy. I'm not judging here. Just saying that if you are a smoker, you might have other characteristics that may contribute to, uh, to lung cancer or make you less prone to have lung cancer. And so because we are not um, putting people into groups and then saying you're going to get the drug and you're not, we're just looking at it after the fact, we don't have the control that we did before. And so there, uh, these kinds of studies are really, really prone to confounding variables. All right, number three, Alex. Okay, lots of vocabulary, and a lot of it is new, so we'll just pause. Double blind. Do the people know whether they're getting the drug? No. Do the scientists know whether who's in which group? No. So nobody knows anything. And when I say nobody, I'm talking about two different groups. Uh, there needs to be some person or some people uh, after the fact who, so let's say there's one piece of paper that has the name of everybody um, uh, in this classroom on it. And then next to each person's name, it's either going to say, you got the drug or you got the placebo. And there's going to be one person sitting in the back room who has that piece of paper and nobody else has that piece of paper. And then separately, the scientists are going to say, oh, these people were 20% more happy, or this person was 20% more happy, and this person was 40% more happy. They've got the same names, but they don't know who was in which group. They're just there to record the results, their observations about how happy you guys are. And then the one person sitting over there is then going to take this uh, happiness information and then uh, match it up with who actually got the drug and who didn't. Good question. Okay, randomized. What does it mean? Yes, let's be a little bit more specific. They are randomly picked. Who is randomly picked? 
the people to put in the study? So we're going to assume you guys are all going to be in the study, and that's not random. Maybe you decided you were going to be in the study, and that's totally fine. To make it a randomized study, we're going to put you into two groups. Some will get the drug and some won't. How are we going to put you in the two groups? Randomly. That's what makes it randomized, okay? I have no control over who decides to show up for my study. It happens to be you guys. But how we decide who gets the happy drug and who gets the fake, that needs to be done randomly. That's what this is. So um, randomly put into the uh, control group and treatment group. And then the last part here, controlled, which is different than case controlled. Say it again. Uh, are you defining what a controlled study is? Yeah. So, yeah, I am. I am asking that. Say it again. It's um, just the part of the study that wasn't changed. I think that's a good way to think of it. Um, we're, we're trying to look at only one aspect, your happiness, not look at anything else. Uh, and so a controlled study is one of these things where um, we split you up into two groups. Some of you get the drug, some of you don't, as opposed to you self-selecting by virtue of you happen to smoke already. And so that puts you into the smokers group, or you don't happen to smoke, and that puts you into the other group, all right? And so controlled, I'm just going to circle the, the phrases here that match with the word controlled. A controlled study means there is the control group and the treatment group, and the scientists are gonna put you into one of those groups. The scientists actively split you guys up. As opposed to the other study where we talked about smokers, that was the case controlled study. Scientists don't decide whether or not you have been a smoker, but something you decided. Okay, so if, uh, I hear an advertisement, uh, like Nicole talks about, we hear ads all the time now. Uh, if I hear an advertisement that says, hey, this drug is going to make you happy, the first thing I want to know is, was it a double-blind, randomized, controlled study? Of course, they're not going to use any of those phrases in the little 30-second advertisement. Uh, maybe there's some fine print. I like how they put it in like a, a font size 3, and it's white against the light background of the TV ad. Um, so maybe there's information in there that's up on the screen for half, half a second. Uh, but these are the kinds of questions that, that I need to, to know the answers to before I buy into anything that they're trying to sell. Okay, number four, we'll go up to Morgan. Okay, um, the ethics of uh, clinical studies, I think there are entire courses on the ethics of clinical studies. Let's spend 60 seconds right now just very briefly touching on what might be an entire course in this area. Um, so participation bias, uh, people that, that read these advertisements in the newspaper and say, oh, okay, I'm going to participate in that study, they are not a random group of people. They might have certain attributes that make them healthier or less healthy, happier or less happy. But, but they're not randomly chosen, and so that's an issue. But we can't we can't go out and just. Uh, I think they are chosen by themselves. They like uh, the the way that it happened for me when I did the study I was in was uh, was I saw an advertisement in the local newspaper and it said we're looking for volunteers to participate in such and such a study. We will give you twenty bucks. It'll take uh, forty five minutes of your time. Show up at this place, you know, uh, any time on these days. And so I went, and I was like, okay, I can do that. And then they told me what the study was, and then they had me perform it, and that was it. But, um, but it, wasn't, it wasn't a random group of people that came. I don't know who else came to participate, but it was a self-selected group. And so there's, there's issues associated with that. And, you know, I mean, like the best thing, the most accurate thing we could do if we were going to buy into any result of a clinical trial would be to have like a draft like where the people, the drug companies get to draft. And, and if you get this thing in the mail, like you might get jury duty, you have to go. So it would be, you, you, get, you, get pulled, uh, you get pulled into one of these clinical trials. You just have to go. It's your obligation. Now, of course, we're, that's not going to happen. I'm just speaking to you as a, 
uh, as somebody who says, if we want the most accurate results, that's how it should be. But it won't ever be that way here. Um, so that leads us to this idea of the participation bias. Uh, small sample size, um, you know, if I just pull the people in this room and I give you the happy drug versus the unhappy drug, and I say this works for all Americans, I'm trying to generalize to 300 million people, and there's probably not enough people in this room for me to get solid results. But the fact is, the more people I give this drug to and the longer my study runs, the more expensive it is. And so there's this balance between, well, let's, we don't want it to be expensive, so we can't have too many people doing the study but the more people, the stronger the results. So it's kind of a trade-off. Um, some studies require a long, long, long time before you actually know the results. Um, right now, raise your hand if there is a cell phone in your pocket. Okay. Uh, 10 years ago, I think if I'd asked that same question, it would have been a lot smaller number, number of people that had a cell phone in their pocket. The fact is, we, we don't know the long-term effects of having a cell phone in your pocket. I mean, think about how many hours a day you have a cell phone in your pocket versus like 10, 15 years ago, like very few people did that. 30 years ago, nobody did that. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to put any a scare in anybody, but I'm just saying that it would take a long time for us to know if there are any health effects of having this particular device in our pocket, you know, 15 hours a day, day in and day out. Um, and so if it takes a long time to get the results, well, you guys aren't waiting for the results. You've decided I'm, you know, I'm just going to have this cell phone in my pocket. I think it's fine even though nobody really knows. We haven't, there hasn't been enough time to know whether or not it's fine. Okay, and then uh, last one here, um, uh, studies may promote medication. I happen to think, this is me personally speaking, I happen to think that the US is over-medicated, that we treat a lot of things that, we treat a lot of things with drugs, which we should be treating uh, maybe with uh, education and, and behavior. Um, I think that there are a lot of unhealthy behaviors. I'm not talking to the people in this room. I'm just saying here in the US, I think there are a lot of people with a lot of unhealthy behaviors. And instead of having drugs to treat these kinds of things, maybe modifying the behavior would be a better bet. Um, and studies perhaps promote drug usage as this is how you should do it instead of changing behavior or becoming educated. A small list of studies covering what could be an entire course, um, but just stuff to think about. Okay, so uh, here is the plan. What, what time do we end? Is it 45? Okay, we have 45 minutes. I think that's enough time to do what I'm gonna ask you to do. There are three studies that follow. Uh, the first one here is about male baldness. These studies are quite a bit longer. These are actual articles that I grabbed. So the male baldness one goes to the middle of the next page. And so what you're going to do is you're going to read. And so maybe for the next five minutes at least, we'll just uh, have quiet reading before the groups kind of come together and answer the questions. So there's a whole slew of questions. I'd encourage you actually just to take a quick glimpse at the questions before you start reading. And then as you read, you can say, oh, all right, they're, they're asking me, I'm going to have to think about what the target population will be in the sample. I'm going to have to think about what the control group is and what the treatment group is. Maybe you can kind of underline or highlight some of these things as you read them because the reading is a bit long. All right? So three different articles. Every time it's the same set of questions. Uh, I'll walk around and answer, but certainly work with each other. Uh, so maybe just at least five minutes of quiet to read the first article and then start talking to your neighbors.